we have a roller coaster we're building. We To test the roller coaster, we started at the top of a high hill. We let it go down that hill, go through a dip, and up the next hill. Um, and instead of going over the hill, it only reaches a height of 25 meters, as stated in the problem. At this point, I would like you to pause the video and work on setting up the problem, drawing your picture and assigning variables uh, relevant to the problem, anything that you think you might need. This is a skill that students need a lot of practice in. And so here is your opportunity. Uh, then, of course, once we go to the next slide, then I will show you how I set up the problem. But now pause the video and set it up for yourself. We have a roller coaster and the builders are testing the roller coaster, so they set the roller coaster on the on a hill, and we have a hill that goes down through a dip and then comes back up. And of course, if we have a good roller coaster, we want the roller coaster to move up and over this hill. That's what we want. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when testing the roller coaster, we find that it only reaches a certain point. So we go from this position here to this position, we go down the hill and up the hill, but we don't quite get over the next hill. So we're gonna have to tune this uh, this roller coaster, and one way is by looking at friction. So can we work out what the average friction force is? Now, we're told if we take this dip, the bottom of the dip, we're told distances from the bottom of the dip to the height of our roller coaster at these two points. So we really have a before picture and an after picture, but this is something that you've done before. This is after here. But this is something that you've done before. For example, when you were doing projectile motion, you had an initial and final positions of the projectile, and you could find the final velocities or you could find the initial velocities. Um, so we have a height, h1, and we have a second height, h2. And we want to know what was the average friction force as we traveled along. Now we're told that, that we, our engineers have worked out what the distance traveled between these two positions is. So this is some distance d. All right, so that in this case, it is 400 meters along the track. And we want to know what, what's our friction, because then we can, if we can reduce our friction, maybe that will allow us to get up and over the next hill. The easiest way to solve this problem, this is a problem that has a varying force. Uh, certainly, it's changing in direction. This is not a problem that we could do before without energy considerations. And so now we can use energy consideration to try and solve this problem. So we drew our picture and we assigned variables, uh, but we want to use energy. And of course, if we want to use energy, we're going to need some other things to take into consideration um, because kinetic energy involves velocities. So we're going to want to think about what is the initial velocity at this position and what is my final velocity at this position. We are also going to, since there's nothing that says this is a frictionless track, we are also going to want to take into consideration any non-conservative work involved in this process. Of course, this is probably how we're going to get our friction force, because that's, that's where in our energy considerations the friction will enter in. Right? So once again, I'd like you to uh, now Think about what the values are for the initial velocity of the cart and the final velocity of the roller coaster at the two points, the initial point and the final point are. Um, and then also write down a formula for the uh, non-conservative work. Then see if you can write out the energy conservation equation for non-conservative work. Uh, pause the video.
work all of those things out, and then restart the video, and I'll go through my calculation of those ideas. One thing you'll have to do is choose a zero for the potential. Remember, potential is always depends on where we set our zero. For gravity, we could choose any given point. We could choose here where we end. We could choose here where we start. We could choose here on the dip. So any of those will be valid. They will alter our calculation slightly, but what we'll find in the end is it, it comes out in the wash. Okay, so you should have set up the problem. Now let's go through and see how my setup matches yours. We know that the roller coaster, as stated in the problem, starts at rest so that my initial velocity is zero. Uh, when it comes down and goes back up, it's going to come to a stop before it begins to slide down again. And so I know my final velocity is also zero. So my initial velocity is zero, my final velocity is zero. It means that between my initial and final position, the change in the kinetic energy from initial to final position, this is going to be zero. I didn't gain any kinetic energy. Um, that's going to make the kinetic energy uh, portion of energy conservation really easy. Uh, now for the uh, potential energy considerations, that's going to be slightly more challenging. I have to pick my, where I want my zero. Since I'm given the height relative to this bottom of the dip, I'm going to choose this as my potential gravitational potential equal to zero uh, position. Uh, again, you could pick any point you wanted. It wouldn't uh, really affect anything. You'd find, in fact, it's a good exercise pick a different point and see if you get the same answer we do in the end. We also said we needed to work out what our non-conservative work was between our initial and final points. Of course, this is going to be our friction force uh, dotted into our displacement. Uh, now, our displacement is a vector that's changing all the time, and our friction is a, is a vector that's changing along the entire path. But one nice thing is, if we look at this, my displacement is always just along that path. This is my, my little displacement vector. And my friction force, that's always going to point also along the surface but back the way that I'm moving, uh, against the way that I'm moving, right? It's trying to slow me down. So I can always see that no matter what my displacement vector is, the dot product is just going to be the magnitude of my displacement along that little piece times my the magnitude of my friction vector. This is going to be just the magnitude of what that dr is times my friction vector. But then it's negative, so my dot product tells me this is negative, or I could multiply by minus one, right? Uh, or uh, if that's confusing, we can ignore that and just write this as a minus magnitude of f times dr. And so the, the magnitude that we're going to get, it's not going to be the friction force at every point. It's just going to get sort of the average friction force along this path. And my my uh, dr, my displacement vector, well, my displacement vector is going to add up along that entire path. And so what I'm going to get in the end, if I add all these things, put all these ideas together, I'm going to get minus my friction force times the, the sum of all of those little displacements, which is going to be d, right? My, all of these little displacements are going to add up to eventually give me a displacement that gets me to that point. Remember, even though we're talking about displacements, we have to have the displacement along this path. So we're really talking about a distance. Uh, we can't just take initial point and final point and get my displacement across the entire thing because that's not what work cares about. Remember, non-conservative uh, forces care about the path taken, not just the endpoints. 
So this then is our total non-conservative work. All right. Well, we've got our non-conservative work. All we have to do is account for our initial and final kinetic energies, our initial and final potential energies. Uh, we already know that our initial and final kinetic energies are going to be zero because the change in their kinetic energies are zero. Uh, well, we know that the change in kinetic energy is zero. We also know that their initial and final kinetic energies are zero. How do we know? Well, let's write it out. Kinetic energy at initial, that's just one half m v initial squared. Of course, the initial is zero, so this is zero. Uh, kinetic energy final, that's just one half m v final squared. Final velocity is zero, so this is also zero. Now let's look at our, our potential energies. We don't have any springs in this problem, so we don't have any spring potentials. So we have a, an initial gravitational potential energy. That's just mass times my acceleration due to gravity, the mass of my car times the acceleration due to gravity, times my height above my zero. We said our zero was this bottom of the, the dip. And so my height initially is h1. Final gravitational potential, that's just, again, mg height above the dip. That's going to be h2. And now I write out my energy equation. Uh, that is initial kinetic energy, which is 0, plus initial gravitational potential energy. That's mg h1 plus my non-conservative work, which is minus F, and this is F average times D. So this is an average force. That has to equal my final mechanical energy of my system. Now there's, again, no kinetic energy. So it'd be final kinetic energy, that's zero, plus my final potential energy, which is MGH2. Fairly straightforward. And now I can just solve for my final, uh, uh, sorry, my average friction force. When I work through some algebra, uh, what I should find is that my average friction force, uh, this is going to be equal to my mass times gravity times my height, h1 minus h2. So the difference in heights divided by the distance along which I traveled. Uh, this result should be independent of where I picked my zero for my gravitational potential. And you can go through the exercise of setting your potential to be the initial position or the final position rather than the dip in the, um, in the track. And you would find that you would end up with a, an average friction force that satisfies the same equation. Now, of course, we should always check our units. Let's see, uh, we have on top, we're gonna have mass times an acceleration. We're gonna have kilograms times a meter per second squared. That's a force, right? This is, an, this is a Newton. And then we're gonna multiply that by a distance minus a distance. So we're gonna get a distance and we're then gonna divide by a distance. So this just comes out to be one. And so sure enough, we get a, a Newton. We get a unit of force. So our units work out, and this is likely to be the correct answer. So at this point, we have a formula that gives us the correct answer. Uh, all we have to do is now plug in our known values for the mass, the height of our cart, both initial and final height, and then the distance along the track. Plug those into our formula and we will have a value for our uh, average friction force. Of course, if we were an engineer, then we could go back and think about how we could reduce this friction. When we put in the values given in the problem statement, we find that our average friction force is about 367.5 Newtons. And so but 
remember, let's think about what we had to do to get to this point. We looked at a problem and we said there's a varying force in here. We can't really use kinematics. We're going to have to use energy conservation. And we're going to have to account for non-conservative forces. We took the initial position and we found what the initial kinetic energy and initial gravitational potential energy were at this position uh, based on where we set our zero. And we had set our zero to be at the bottom of the dip. But again, we could have set it anywhere. We then found what our, our final kinetic energy and final gravitational potential energy were for our system. We looked at what was the non-conservative work done by uh, friction. We had to take that into account. That took some thinking about what, how the friction force relates to our displacement, little displacements all along the path, and then could we add all those displacements up to get a total displacement along the path. Um, then we just, once we had all those concepts down, once we had thought about the problem and thought about what we needed, then sticking it into the equation, crunching the numbers became very simple, right? So as is usual, setting up the problem and figuring out what values you have and what values you might need to think about is always the hardest part. Once we got you know, once we got initial kinetic and initial potential energies, and we took those and we added our non-conservative work and wrote down our final kinetic energy and our final uh, potential energy, uh, solving this equation became very simple. Uh, it was actually populating this equation that was a challenge. Now, one thing that this example doesn't show is we only had one type of potential energy. We could have had multiple. In fact, there are problems in your homework uh, that involve different types of potential energy. You'll have potential energies that are gravitational and springs. All that means is that this in this potential energy initial, this will be whatever my gra initial gravitational potential energy is plus my initial spring potential energy, this final potential energy, this would just be my final gravitational potential and my final spring potential energies. This non-conservative work only had one this time. It was just friction, but of course we could have multiple. We could have, uh, Sorry, we could have the work done by friction. We could have the work done by me pushing on it or some other force. Uh, so we do have to think about what goes into each term in this equation. And there might be multiple things that go into each term. Uh, but once we've got that worked out, writing, actually populating the equation is very simple. And then crunching the numbers is straightforward. All right. So hopefully this is giving you an example of how to deal with non-conservative work and, and solve problems involving energy conservation you, that involve non-conservative forces. It's just an extension of what we talked about in class and some of the examples we went over involving energy conservation when you, all you had is conservative forces. Of course, if all we have are conservative forces, then this is zero when all we have are conservative forces. Our non-conservative work just ends up being zero. So really, this is the more general equation. Uh, anyway, I will hopefully that gives you an idea of how to go forward with your homework. I will uh, see you in class then uh, tomorrow.